Hey everybody, I'm Simon Harris and welcome to the latest episode of the vlog. So today you'll notice the surroundings are a little bit different to normal. I'm not at Dentsu over by Regent's Park, I'm actually with Index Exchange down in Soho. I'm talking to James, a European MD, who's been uh, part of their phenomenal success in this region over the last 24 months or so. James is a super smart guy and I'm really excited to talk to him, so let's get right into it. So James, you're the uh, MD of Index Exchange. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, yourself and what your day-to-day -day looks like. Sure. Um, well, about myself first, I, uh, I moved, uh, my wife and I moved to the UK from Canada in 2015, uh, and I was the first Index employee on the ground in Europe, so my role was to really come and establish the business here. So the day-to-day -day of my role has really changed over the last few years. In, in, in year one, um, it was a lot about setting the operational uh, uh, paradigm, so getting everything from payroll to legal contracts, and like all of those sort of bits and bobs in place so that we could actually you know, be set up and do business here. Uh, then it was hiring people, getting them trained and ramped up, and it was really just getting out and meeting with publishers and telling them who Index was, explaining our value proposition, why we were different, and Roy Beharry and I were the sort of first two people on the street. We just relentlessly uh, did meetings all day long, and I got to know the London Tube system really well, and I got to know the cab systems really well, uh, because I saw a lot of London in that, uh, in that first year. It must have worked worked out for you guys because obviously you've had phenomenal growth in the UK and Europe. Yeah, it's been it's it's been really successful. I think uh, we had really great timing. Uh, I think that when we arrived in the UK, header bidding had already been something that we had had, had essentially bet the entire company on, um, and the the UK market and the European markets were just starting to adopt and we're just starting to look at uh, at header as a, as a method of integrating with exchanges. So we were very lucky, I think, in that sense. Great product, great timing. I think those two things definitely uh, definitely contributed. Uh, since then, my role has really changed a lot. So we've got a team of sort of 25 here now in London. We've got offices in Paris, Dusseldorf. We're opening one in Milan soon, one in Australia. Uh, so it's a lot about leadership. It's a lot about making sure we're hiring the right people. It's a lot about just setting the tone and the paradigms uh, culturally, so that the team can respond to our clients the way that uh, the way that Index was set up to uh, to do that. Sounds like a cool gig. It's a fun, it's a fun job. I have to admit, yeah, I really like what I do. So, Index has been phenomenally successful with publishers over the past twenty-four months. Um, tell me a little bit about what you think is behind this growth. Sure, I, you know, there's really, there's really no secret sauce to it. Index is the kind of company that just, you know, we, we, uh, what's the British expression? Uh, it does what it says on the tin, yeah. right? Uh, we just stay really true to our values. We invest heavily in technology. Uh, we make sure that our people are really focused on the needs of the publisher, and we make sure that our overall business strategy is focused on the needs of our customers. There's some things that are very unique about us. We've never taken outside investment capital. We've built this company over the long term. The, the founders date back uh, more than 15 years now, and our priorities are directly aligned to the long-term priorities of the publishers. We don't have hidden agendas in the same way that we don't have hidden fees, uh, buy side fees, those sorts of things. Uh, so by staying true to those values, uh, it's just allowed us to flourish. It's what's caused our success to be. Yeah, no, it seems to be working. Yeah. So do you think that consolidation amongst SSPs is inevitable? Do you think that under this kind of new competitive pressures, some will go out of business? What's your take on the market? Sure. I, I, I think consolidation across the industry is absolutely inevitable. The paradigm in which we're operating today, there's tons of overlapping technology, there's been tons of overlapping investment, and the reality is the marketplace does not need as many unique and different systems as it has today. Um, what you're seeing is, because of things like Adstock Text, for example, uh, a huge, huge cleanup in the industry. So there's been a lot more accountability instilled, and that's caused the sort of very clean and transparent SSPs and ad exchanges to rise to the top. And what you're also seeing is a lot more cooperation. So uh, around things like the Identity Consortium, we're working closely with AppNexus and LiveRamp and others in that consortium. So I think inevitably within that paradigm, there will be fewer players in the future than there are today. Although it's really way too difficult to understand whether some will go out of business, whether some will merge, whether some will be acquired, some will pivot. Yeah. There's so many different options in there that uh, it's, it's really, really hard to kind of put a mark on it. Yeah.
Okay, James, so do you think that at some point all auctions will have to become first price? That's a big lofty question, but I'll approach it in a few different ways. I, I think that the first thing to remember is that programmatic advertising and auction-based advertising is still really, really new, right? We're just getting started. We're, we're dealing mostly with banner ads at the moment, a little bit of video in the future is out of home, television, literally any marketing message that you're going to put in front of a user. I think in a perfect world, if everything was running on a common unified auction, then a second price auction may be the most efficient because that's what would encourage buyers to bid truthfully. But the reality is we don't live in a perfect world. We have multiple auctions taking place and multiple exchanges uh, you know, under, under very, very different conditions. And the only real auction that matters today is the auction within the publisher's ad server. And that is a first price auction. So if you roll that back and you say that the primary objective is to ensure that buyers are bidding truthfully and that the most efficient bid is going to win for that particular piece of inventory within the publisher's ad server, then absolutely first price auctions are the only way to get there. Right, okay. It's an interesting answer. Okay, James, so as Heather and First Price Auctions become mainstream, how do you guys plan to differentiate yourselves so you can defend that fantastic position that you've built up and grow further? Sure. Um, look, there's, there's two things that have always been at the core of the founding vision for uh, Index Exchange. Uh, one of them is transparency, and the other one is efficiency. So. Our, you know, Andrew, our CEO, kind of saw this many, many years ago. That that's where the industry was really heading. So those aren't really sexy things at the end of the day, right? Um, the, the exchange and ad exchange business within the next two to five years is going to become more and more commoditized and frankly, less and less sexy. Um, so differentiators are going to be really, really hard to point to. So this might sound a little boring, but the reality is by investing heavily in owning our own infrastructure, where we have absolutely control over our costs um, we can run a lot more efficiently and we can run a lot faster um, those are the things that are really going to matter and we can absolutely maintain transparency within that paradigm okay so the kind of uh, uptick in like volume and that type of thing you're able to cope with much more easily than if you're on a public cloud uh, yeah absolutely there's a, there's a ton of businesses where it makes sense to move them entirely to the public cloud, right? In many ways, it can be very, very efficient for a lot of analytics businesses and a lot of other types of IT infrastructure. But for a core transactional business like ours, where you have to respond incredibly fast, you know, 50 to 100 milliseconds, public cloud infrastructure is really designed to be multi-purpose. It's got layers and layers of virtualized operating systems, and it's designed to run many different types of software. So inevitably, it's going to be a lot slower than a machine that you design from scratch and deploy yourself to only do one thing. Okay, so you've got that kind of speed and scalability. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that makes sense. And, 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 and frankly, being able to forecast your costs in a known entity, public cloud infrastructure really operates on a spot market. So you don't know from one minute to the next how much you're actually going to have to pay for that infrastructure. Yeah, my gut tells me there's a few people struggling with that at the moment, but I'm, I won't ask you that question. I, I think it's definitely created challenges for companies because the capital expenditures involved in acquiring your own hardware, uh, customizing it, setting it up, we have a dedicated team that pretty much flies around the world nonstop deploying new servers in our data centers. In fact, in 2017, I think we deployed something like 4,000 new servers across nine data centers globally. I always equate it to the, uh, to the old adage of painting the castle. You know, you start at one end, and by the time you finish, you have to start painting all over again. Uh, so there's a similar analogy there, I think. Cool. Okay, James, so long term, do you think that pricing models uh, on the supply side will move from a percentage of media to a CPM or something else? So I think I'll break that up into two, to two chunks. One, uh, let's talk about open market. I think open market, a percentage of media, really is the most sensible model because you want our interests as an exchange aligned completely with our, the interests of our publishers. So you, they want us to try to drive the most efficient transaction for them and a percentage of media makes sense there. No question that percentages are coming down, uh, efficiency is taking over, all of those things are changing, but fundamentally at the core, I believe the percentage model will always stay in place. 
move that to a private market paradigm and things will inevitably have to change. Uh, I believe that if we're truly going to, if, if programmatic uh, will truly disrupt the ad server in the way that many people think it can, um, then a percentage of media model is probably not going to make sense. That would be the same as a publisher paying uh, DFP or other ad servers on a percentage of media and they just, they simply don't do that. Right, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. I don't know what that end model will be, um, but... It's probably a way away as well, I'm guessing, but... It, it probably is. Okay, James, so last question for you, and it's a big one. Do you think the companies that straddle the buy and the sell side are conflicted by that position? Absolutely, without a doubt. Um, it's, it's been a, a, one of the tenets of our value proposition is that we play one side of the field only. We really, really align with publishers and we really focus on their needs. I think it's inevitable that if you're trying to do both, somebody is going to suffer. Right? If you're accountable to the performance of the advertiser, ultimately your systems are liable to make a decision that will, that will penalize the publisher. Um, or on the other side, if you're trying to maintain accountability to the publisher, ultimately you're going to make a decision that penalizes the advertiser. I think the only way that this can function fairly and transparently uh, is for companies to stay on one side or the other. Yeah, there's no question about that. Okay. Yeah, I agree with you. Okay guys, that's it for me for now. Don't forget, if you've enjoyed this episode of the vlog, please hit subscribe on YouTube, give it a share on LinkedIn or Twitter. I want to say a massive thank you to James and Index Exchange for having me here today. It's been such an interesting conversation. James is really, really smart and uh, I've learned so much talking to him. Actually, that's true of everyone that works over at Index Exchange. Some of the smartest people around, every time you talk to them, you learn something. So it's been a really good learning experience for me and really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to try and do a vlog on something maybe a little bit technical later on this week, so that's one to keep your eyes peeled for. Uh, probably something around optimization, maybe, unless some big news topic kind of blows up in the interim. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that, and I'll see you in the next one.